Now it's time for Chewing the Fat with your host, Bevan Jones. Well, g'day and welcome to another edition of Chewing the Fat. Bevo here down at Rackets and Strings today. Shout out to Matt and the crew. Come and see the guys and they'll look after you with some great deals at 139A Henley Beach Road, Mile End. And we're joined by a very special guest. It is Darren Kale, Darren Killer Kale, as he likes to be known these days. <laughs> um, he's been one of the best coaches we've ever seen from Australia. He's actually a brilliant professional tennis player as well, made it to number 22 in the world and won three career titles and he's taken Simona Halep, Leighton Hewitt and Andre Agassi to number one in the world. Killer, great to have you on Chewing the Fat. Mate, talk to us about your junior career and how you became a professional tennis player. Uh, yeah, long story. Well, firstly, pleasure to be here and Chewing the Fat, I love the name of your show, so well done with that. Um, yeah, it was, I was a footballer, I guess, coming from a football family until I was about 15 or 16 and was playing like everybody else in junior tennis and was maybe just a little bit better at tennis than I was at football back in those days. Didn't like to take a bump, so <laughs> didn't have to do that in tennis. So ventured into tennis and I caught a break. I had a guy in Melbourne, Bob Carmichael, I'm not sure if you remember, Nails Carmichael, who was a famous Australian coach who sort of took me under his wing and believed in me and gave me a spot at the Australian Institute of Sport when I was about 17 years of age so I got a chance to spend two years in Canberra playing with the best tennis players in Australia so for me that was the break I needed worked pretty hard and then the rest was history. And uh, talk about your coaching obviously as I mentioned before you became a, a professional tennis player with your singles um, reaching number 22 in the world and number 10 with doubles and and those three career titles as a singles player but where did the coaching all begin? Yeah I guess it kind of began it's in the blood a little bit sitting on the bench at the Port Adelaide and watching the Magpies play every week and getting a chance to experience how my father was coaching Port and so I always kind of interested in the way he went about it tennis is completely different obviously and to be honest I would have loved to have had a longer career in, in tennis I was retired basically by the time I was 25 because I'd had about a dozen knee surgeries so my tennis career finished a little bit short but because of that I got a chance to hit with a young kid here in South Australia called Leighton Hewitt. He was 12 years of age. He called me up and asked me if I would take a look at him and uh, we worked together for about eight or nine years. So one bad thing happened and one great thing happened that I was able to get, have a chance to coach someone like Leighton first up and then ventured on to Agassiz and then Simona Halep after that. So it's been a, a great ride but certainly having the chance to work with three great champions, I've been very fortunate. As you mentioned, um, you've taken all three of them to number one in the world and that must be a massive thrill. Um, what was the approach that you used? Um, I guess each one are different individuals and the way they play and the way they go about it. But what sort of approach did you use for those three? Yeah, I think the most important thing when you're a tennis coach is to make sure that you're coaching through their eyes and not coaching tennis through your eyes because everybody sees the game a little bit differently. So it takes a little while to get to know the player, ask a lot of questions, do a lot of listening, earn a lot of trust. And once you can understand why they make certain decisions in certain times, why they're taking the ball cross court and take, instead of taking it down the line, why they're not coming into the net. Now, all of that stuff takes time. So you have to understand playing to their strengths is more important than doing sometimes things that you see. And I think it's the most important thing in coaching. I think sometimes a coach can look at a player and all you see are weaknesses and you worry about those weaknesses too much. Whereas I've always tried to see weaknesses and that's fine. You're trying to improve the weaknesses, but work around the strengths and really work to the positives. And I think I did that pretty well with Leighton. Uh, certainly with Andre, he was already an all-time legend before I started with him at 32 years of age. So to come in with somebody like that and, and preach tennis, it was a little bit nerve wracking, to be honest. And certainly I was really nervous about that moment, but he was great and he was willing to learn new things and, and willing to try different things. And after 14 months to Together, he got back to number one in the world, which was amazing by him. And, and so I think it's really important as a coach is to do a lot of listening, to make sure that you don't try to coach tennis the way you played it and that you coach through their eyes, not your own. And uh, Simona Halep, as I mentioned before, won the Australian Open, got to world number one, and you stopped coaching her um, quite abruptly. Uh, what was the reason for that? Well, we spent four years together, so it was a long time. I, I think for any tennis coach when you're working one-on-one -on -one. it's a little bit different for football or rugby or whatever it may be because you have a team of players coming through and your roster changes a lot so the message can keep turning over a little bit with tennis with that one person for four years and it's not the same message all the time but after three or four years you've pretty much emptied the bucket with all your knowledge and while as coaches we want to keep improving and keep learning they know what's coming after three or four years so I've always said that the coaching is really in a three, four year period. After that, it becomes more of a managing role. 
as far as the tennis coach is concerned. There are exceptions, but I think it was just time for her to get a new voice, to get a new set of eyes. Uh, also, my boy here in Adelaide, at Benjamin, is doing year 12 at Poulton Grammar, and there's a chance for me to spend more time uh, as a family back here in Adelaide. And he would like to go back to the US next year and play some college tennis. So 35 weeks, 40 weeks on the road a year for the last 20 years. Uh, it's not easy being a tennis coach, but certainly privileged, and it's doing a job that I love. We wish Benjamin all the best and hopefully you can see him uh, reaching the same heights as yourself. Um, your individual career, let's talk about that. Now, 1988, you made the semis of the US Open. You played against Mats, Mats Volander. You beat Boris Becker along the way. Mats um, beat you in that game and then ended up winning that tournament. But that must have been a massive thrill though, Darren, making it through the US Open semis. I crushed Boris. You didn't say that I crushed Boris. <laughs> uh, I, I, he had blisters on his feet and he struggled in the round before but I don't tell him that we, we don't tell Boris that he was struggling to move around the court but I got him on a, on a day where he was not feeling great and that was kind of my game also is that if the good players played well then I was in big trouble but if they weren't having a great day or if something wasn't clicking or if they had a weakness uh, they knew that I was going to be a pain in the backside to play against because the way I played was to look for those weaknesses to really harp on them and stick to a strategy and stick to a game plan I guess that's why it's helped my coaching a little bit as well because whilst I wasn't a great tennis player I recognized ways to win tennis matches when maybe I shouldn't have won tennis matches and that was one of those days for sure but the experience of the US Open yeah, back then it's a little bit different then than what it is now it was much more of a zoo back then you're playing on an outside court people yelling and screaming people walking in between points people talking to other people on the other side of the stadium uh, you can smell hot dog smells going through the stadium and uh, it, it was a real circus playing at the end I loved it because again I've come from AFL uh, the Magpies back here where all you hear is noise. So for me, that was like playing at home. I struggled a little bit more when it was quiet. So the US Open for me was always a place where I played my best tennis. And in that same year, I heard from a little bird an interesting story that you actually exchanged a tennis racket for an Australian boomer's singlet back in 1988. Tell us all about that. Is that Smythe? <laughs> it may well be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, I had a chance to represent Australia at the Olympics in 88 in Seoul, and that was a great experience for me. And I knew Phil, and he's a, a great guy. So I had an opportunity straight after the US Open to go off to Seoul and, and represent Australia. And my biggest thrill about that was getting to hang out with all the other athletes. It was an amazing time for me. And tennis was very new back into the Olympics back then. So it wasn't so much about me playing. It was more about going to the athletics or going to the basketball and supporting the Aussies. And uh, we had a great time, that's for sure. Oh, that's terrific. And um, just a bit of a hypothetical one now. We all love Nick – or some, some of us do, some of us don't love Nick Kyrgios, but he's definitely one of the, the most talented players ever to play for Australia. And um, he's come out and said he doesn't want to coach. But hypothetically, if you were to coach him, how would you approach it? Do you know how many times I get asked this question? <laughs> I get this asked question a lot. It's because he is so good. And, you know, answering this question is difficult because, honestly, if – any coach in the world knew that Nick was ready to put in the work and to, to go at it and give 100%. There's not a coach in the world that wouldn't look at that job and go, all right, that would be a pretty good guy to coach because he's that talented. That, that's right. That might be Nick now, yeah. <laughs> you want to get, get a good deal. Um, so, you know, I think more importantly for him is making sure that his body is going to sustain the longevity that it needs on tour and he puts the work in off the court. To be honest, the tennis is great. His tennis IQ is fantastic. It's not that a coach needs him to come in and tell him what he needs to do on the court because I don't know about you, but how often do you see him play and go, oh, my God, that was the wrong shot? He never does that. He knows how to play. He knows what to do to win. It's more about the body breaking down at times and obviously the head breaks down a little bit as well when the body's not feeling great. So he gets the body right. I think you would see a different Nick. But be perfectly honest, the last couple of years, I think he's done really well. He's improving a lot. He's doing more work off the court. We're starting to see better results. I know his ranking dipped a little bit, but I would rather see consistent performances throughout the course of the year than the peaks and valleys that we have with Nick. We know he can play great tennis. The the tough thing for him is because the body doesn't look after him that well is that consistently in a tournament to keep winning round after round after round uh, that's a difficult thing for him and on any given day he can beat anyone but he needs to improve the the fitness in the body to make sure it looks after him but as I said before any coach would take a good look at that if Nick was ready to take on a coach to to move to that next level. Well, let's hope so because it's a prestigious talent, that's for sure. So, um, mate, just finally, uh, the name Killer, where's that come from? 
You know who gave me that was, do you remember Mark Beers? Mark Beers was a former tennis player. He used to play for Collingwood, actually. So he's from Victoria, and his dad's actually well involved in tennis in Melbourne. And I was, just, I grew about a foot when I was about 17 years of age. So I was a late developer. So I was actually this little guy playing against all the big guys when I was 16 or 17 as a junior. And I was called Little Killer because I was a decent tennis player. And then I grew a foot out of nowhere and little got dropped. So I want to tell you that was a really good story behind the story, but it's not really, it's actually kind of boring. But Mark Beers was the guy, I think he was 22 for Collingwood back in the day, but he was the guy that called me little killer, which then turned into killer. Okay, I like it. And now finally, we're going to finish with a thing called Manic Minute. So uh, it's basically going to ask you a series of questions just really quickly in a minute. Uh, we'll start with your favorite food. Snitzel. Favorite drink? Coke Zero. Favorite movie? Mm, Top Gun. Favorite tourist destination? France. Uh, why is that? I uh, just love the country, love the people. Um, also, Simona winning last year. It'll be a memory that I have forever. Toughest opponent? For me, no question, Ivan Lendl. Okay, um, he's a bit of a tough one on the off, on and off the court. It used to be quite serious. Um, is there a lighter side to, to Ivan? No, super funny off the court. No, whatever people think of him on the court, complete opposite off the court. Very nice guy, very professional. Had a chance to practice with him a lot during my career as well. And he helped me a lot on the court. And uh, I was actually the guy that helped him start working with Andy Murray. So I got to know Ivan very well off the court. He's a super guy. 2019 AFL Premier? Port Adelaide. Good answer. <laughs> 2019 Brownlow medalist. Mm, what about I say, that's a very good question. I want to say someone by, from Port Adelaide, but I won't. I'll go someone else. I'm going to say Lockie Neal. Good answer. He's playing some great footy. Well, Darren Killer-Kale, it's been a pleasure having you on Chewing the Fat today, mate. Keep up the great work. Um, like I said before, hopefully Benjamin can follow in your footsteps and uh, we'll see you doing some great things in the future as a commentator and, and keep up the good work, the coaching as well. Cheers, mate. Thanks so much. Cheers. Cheers.